Hello and welcome to the first episode of the White House Historical Association's 2021 Quarterly Lecture Series, White House History with Susan Page. I'm Stuart McLaurin and I have the privilege of serving as the President of the White House Historical Association. Typically, I'd have the honor of hosting all of you in our wonderful headquarters at Decatur House on Lafayette Square, but I'm pleased that we have the opportunity to share this program with more people than we could accommodate in our space there. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to recognize and thank the members of our Board of Directors and National Council on White House History that are tuning in this evening. Their counsel and support are fundamental to our success as an association. I also want to say hello to our friends from our Presidential Sites Summit Network that are joining us today. There are actually hundreds of presidential sites across the country, and I encourage all of our viewers to learn more about some of your local sites in your area. This year, the White House Historical Association is celebrating our 60th anniversary. We were founded by First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy in 1961 as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. And since then, our mission has been to preserve, protect, and share the extraordinary legacy of the White House over the, its 221-year history. Throughout this year, we will host a series of programs and other initiatives that further this mission. I encourage you to remain apprised of all that we're doing on our website, whitehousehistory.org. We've worked closely with our friends at the Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation and LBJ Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, to produce this program on President Johnson. As you know, this year's White House Christmas ornament, which we will reveal on April 1st, will commemorate President Johnson's legacy as the 36th President of the United States. Now I'd like to introduce my good friend, Mark Updegrove, to give his opening remarks. In addition to being a friend of mine, Mark is a terrific friend of the White House Historical Association, and he works very closely and collaboratively with us on our Presidential Sites Summit Planning Committee. Mark is the President and CEO of the LBJ Foundation and has been a wonderful partner in this program and many more. Mark? Thank you, Stuart. We're pleased to be working with the White House Historical Association throughout the year to honor President Johnson. And today you have a wonderful group of panelists who will shed light on his life and consequential legacy, including his daughters, Linda Johnson Robb and Lucy Baines Johnson, longtime aide Lloyd Hand, and USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page. We look forward to seeing many of you here in Texas this fall for the next Presidential Sites Conference. And congratulations to you, Stuart, and your colleagues at the White House Historical Association on your 60 glorious years. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure working with you on this program and with your colleagues who were very helpful and supportive as well. As President Johnson is the focus of our 2021 White House Christmas ornament, I look forward to honoring him throughout our 60th year. And I can't think of a more appropriate way than hearing from his two daughters, Linda Johnson Robb and Lucy Baines Johnson to start us off, as well as his former Chief of Protocol and a good friend of mine, Ambassador Lloyd Hand. Now I'd like to introduce Susan Page, who will be our moderator for the quarterly lecture series throughout this 60th anniversary year. Among Susan's many accomplishments, she is the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today. She's covered a number of presidential campaigns and administrations. She's interviewed nine presidents and she's the author of the recent book on Barbara Bush. Thank you, Susan, and I know you all will enjoy this very special program. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, what a privilege it is for me to be able to participate in this wonderful lecture series, and particularly this marvelous first episode of it, where we're gonna hear from people who knew our 36th president so well, can give us a glimpse of things, uh, how things really were in the White House. I'm gonna offer just very brief introductions of them, but we have longer biographies on our website, whitehousehistory.org. You can learn more about their own remarkable lives and the many honors all of them have received. First, Linda Johnson Robb. For more than a half century, she has been an activist on behalf of children 
Robinson's literacy. She is also a former first lady of Virginia, the wife of Charles Robb, a former governor and senator. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Next, Lucy Baines Johnson. She has worked for decades in business and philanthropy, especially on issues of social justice, health care, and the environment. Thank you so much for being here. I am delighted to participate. That's great. And Lloyd Hand, when Lloyd Johnson was, was the Senate Majority Leader, he hired Lloyd Hand, then a guy in his 20s, a recent UT graduate, as an assistant. And when LBJ was in the White House, he hired him again as the U.S. Chief of Protocol. Lloyd Hand, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about, about living in the White House. Linda Johnson, Rob, you were 20 years old when your parents moved into the White House. At the time, you were happily a student at the University of Texas. Why did you decide to, to leave all that and move back in with your folks? Well, as Lucy knows, I did it reluctantly. I did not want to give up my independence. And, and I loved being in Austin. I think everybody who's ever lived in Austin wants to go back to Austin. But um, uh, my parents, tried to get me to do it. And they said, oh, we really need you. You know, you're going to be able to, to substitute for mother when she's not able to be somewhere. And you'll get to see all this history right in front of you. And I was a history student. So they played to my, my interests. And um, my mother said, now, I uh, uh, think you should keep a diary. It's a very good discipline. So um, anyway, I came up and um, I did get to substitute for mother uh, when we had events. And I did have the great pleasure of getting to see a lot of things up close. The diary didn't do so well. It was mostly trash. It was, I had to do it. So it was okay. Thursday, got up at 8 a.m., studied Latin. Uh, gee, it's awful. Uh, I had a date with, with Jim. Jim is so handsome. I'm just crazy about him. <laughs> Whatever. It was worthless. Every once in a while, you come across something that's funny. And the other day, I was looking uh, at something, and I realized that I had Warren Beatty at my table at a dance that we had had. With, I think it was Princess um, Irene of Greece. But there he was. And I remember him telling me, I'm working on a movie now, and it's about the Russian Revolution. It's about an American name. I, and I think I remember his name was, was Reed, Jack Reed. And, then, and that was in 1967, February. He didn't get that movie to the screen until uh, 1981. <laughs> so a lot of things take a long time between the time it's birthed and the time it's uh, mature enough. There were a lot of funny things that happened to me and I'm, I enjoyed it. And sometimes that diary comes in handy. Well, it's uh, it's certainly something to keep. I'm glad that your mother encouraged you to keep it. You know, Lucy Face Johnson, you were a teenager at that point. And when we were talking, you said that your first night in the White House, you almost burned it down but I don't know what it was that you did. Can you tell us about that? Oh, I'd love to. Public life was uh, like the family farm for many people where everybody had a job from grandma to the toddler. And as a young girl, I remember well bringing in my parents' friends' coats and putting them up on the bed. And so being involved in public life was uh, a very natural for me. But of course, uh, anything was natural other than the time after November 22nd, 1963. The nation had been assaulted. Our hearts were broken. We'd been draped in black. It was an exceedingly difficult time. And uh, I found myself wandering up the stair steps of our home at the Elms uh, and hearing my parents have raised voices. And that was a, an unusual thing. And I, I was sort of startled. So I did what I would not like to have to admit that I did. I sort of leaned in and, and listened. And my mother was saying to my father, Lyndon, any day but that, 
any day. I just cannot move into the White House on December 7th. And I was not a student of history like my sister. I hadn't even had an American history course yet. And so I didn't appreciate why my mother was resisting so much starting their life in the White House on the day that would, for them, live in infamy for forever. The, the anniversary of the day Pearl Harbor had been uh, bombed. But of course, I came to understand that. And on December 7th, I found, uh, like my mother and all the rest of the family, we were moving into the White House for the next five years. Well, my father had been working nonstop from dawn to midnight, as had my mother. And um, they decided to take a little bit of a respite to go to their good friend and staff member, Walter Jenkins' home, and have a couple of hours of off time. And I asked Walter and Marjorie Jenkins' daughter, Beth Jenkins, who was a very close friend of mine, to come over to the White House. Well, I'd been on stage for a couple of weeks and feeling enormous stress. Everything I said or did needed to be just right, and mostly I needed not to be heard. And all of a sudden, there I was with Beth in this beautiful room with this fabulous fireplace. And I turned to her and I said, Beth, do you know anything about fireplaces? And she said, well, I think I know a little about fireplaces. And I said, do you, do you think we the flu is open? And she looked at it and she said, yeah, I think so. And uh, uh, so we went to light the fireplace and of course you can tell what the rest of the story is going to be the flu was not properly uh, uh fully opened and i had only been in that room a matter of a, a few moments and barely knew where the connecting bathroom was and i i fell my way through to the bathroom and picked up a little juice glass and uh, uh, filled it with water and felt my way back into the uh, bedroom in front of the fireplace trying to put it out. And obviously that was not going to be an effective way of doing it. So I went back to the bathroom and it was getting smokier and smokier by the moment. And I took a trash can and I put it into the bathtub, filled it up and it was enough water to douse the fire. So I felt relieved over that. And I went over to my desk, which was in front of a large window in the north portico of the White House. And I was in my nightgown and I climbed up on the desk and I pulled up in almost a seemingly Herculean sort of a way uh, the giant window that was in front of me to let the smoke out. And I saw a White House policeman looking up at me immediately under my nightgown. And as a young 16 year old, I was mortified. Well, the first week in the White House, my mother had me uh, helping others to clean the smoke off <laughs> of the walls. Uh, it was uh, certainly not the way I anticipated starting life off there, but it was a big humility lesson. <laughs> and humility is a really good thing for all of us to have if we're fortunate enough to be residents of the White House. And uh, I got mine the first week. Uh, Praise God, I did not uh, establish myself as the person who burned the White House down, but there were a few moments where I was deeply concerned that that might have been all that was remembered. <laughs> well, I can only imagine the reaction of your parents when they came home and discovered this, what had happened. Lloyd, let me ask you something actually from President Johnson's perspective. Of course, you knew him well. Presidents have a lot to worry about. And I wonder if President Johnson worried about his daughters who were then living with him in the White House. And was he was he glad that, that they were living there? Um, you know, I'm not sure that I remember much about that. He loved those girls and he loved uh, having them around. Um, we lived, when we, we would go back and forth in Austin and Washington, we lived in the uh, home of the of uh, LBJ in Austin, um, and uh, he would come there with them. But but I don't remember, frankly, Susan, him saying anything one with the other about it. I'm sure he did. I'm sure that he loved having him near to him. 
he was uh, quite unusual in many ways. And I'm sure we'll talk about some of that. But one of them was that he loved buying clothes for his daughter, his wife, uh, staff members. Um, I remember the first visit of the Pope and we were all in the Waldorf Towers awaiting the Pope. I was supposed to get him to Cardinal Spellman. And, uh, and President had uh, dress designers in the suite, had dresses in the suite for the different ones to try on. It was just something. When he would come to visit us in California, uh, he would always want to go shopping uh, for the girls and Mrs. Johnson and others. Uh, so uh, it would be inconceivable to me that both of them wouldn't love to have their daughters near them, and particularly in the White House. You know, that's such a great story. I didn't realize that Lyndon Johnson was a personal shopper for his uh, for his daughters. Was he? Did he have good taste? Did he buy stuff that you liked? My father was a giver. He took enormous pleasure out of being able to give something to somebody that would give them pleasure. And so he or he would send others to go out and try to find dresses, not just for Linda and me and mother, but for every member of the staff, especially those that might be away from loved ones during the holidays, that sort of thing. And uh, to see uh, a shining face uh, looking back at him saying, I really appreciate what you've done, gave Lyndon Johnson just, uh, it buoyed his spirits in a way that all of us were grateful for. Now, I'd just like to add to that, Lucy, that he didn't necessarily understand the fact that we might not all want to be wearing the same dress. <laughs> so I went on with him on a trip and he uh, got found a local designer and they brought in a big rack of clothes and daddy went through and said okay linda you try this one on and i would try them all on and he found one he liked so he said okay i'll take it in brown i wanted oh he liked bright colors so he'd have it in blue and red and and he gave the same dress to me and to the cook at the ranch and to lucy and to one of his secretaries everybody got the same dress and I don't think he quite understood that it would be a little better if it had been different dresses for us. But he liked the dress. And so he thought it would just look great on everybody. And it always, well, most of the time, we let him think it did. <laughs> and he, the other thing Lucy didn't say is he always wanted, when he gave a gift, he wanted you to, to put it on if it was a dress. And so he would... He, we'd get this great package for Christmas, whether it was a dress or whether it was a pair of, of slacks that he found that he liked. He would get it and then he'd want you to immediately go into another room and put the outfit on. And uh, anyway, he did care very much about all of us. You know, Lord Hand, there's, I've been watching The Crown on Netflix, uh, as as most of America, I think. And there is an episode on The Crown that involves the Johnson White House. It was a black tie dinner that was given for Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden. And the depiction on The Crown is of a really quite a wild evening of drinking and dancing and dirty limericks. Uh, and you were the chief of protocol at that point. Can you tell us about the dinner? Was that a pretty accurate depiction of what went on? That was an absolutely fake news description. I couldn't believe it. I turned to my wife, Anne, and I said, you know, that is outrageous because we were involved from the beginning to the end. Uh, and in those days when there was a, a, a particularly important visit, particularly state visit, although this is what we call a private visit, the president wanted me to take his car uh, and his driver rather than the one that I had assigned him. So, Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden were staying at the British Embassy. We went to, um, to see them and had our pictures taken inside, signed a book and all of that. So we got into the limousine. And I, don't, I don't know whether any of you are old enough to remember, but there were, were those days limousines that had a drive shaft down the middle and banquet seats that faced each other. And I was seated opposite Princess Margaret and was opposite Lord Snowden. And this car started off and the, and the drive shaft spun and then caught on. And when it did, it threw me right in her lap. Well, <laughs> everybody thought that was really funny. I felt a little awkward. She didn't think 
me at all. But um, so I had a feeling this was, evening was not going to go well. We got we got to the White House, and the, the dance was before the dinner. Lord Snowden grabbed my wife Ann, and they were off dancing. And I said, "Your Royal Highness, would you care to dance?" She said, "No, I'll let you know when I want to dance." And she was tapping her foot impatiently with him that he had taken Ann to dance. Um, so uh, I, I knew that wasn't going too well. But I will tell you, there was none of that described. You know, they showed a bathroom scene. There's no bathroom in the whole White House. It looks like this. It's a kind of a, of a bathroom you'd see in a stadium or, or, or some other kind of a mansion. I mean, it was just all made up. The, the, the dialogue, the vulgarity, the drinking. Of course, there was drinking at the White House. I must say, I've never seen anybody uh, inebriated at the White House event. But um, uh, I'll add just a little bit, because I've answered your question, that it was, there was nothing, not, not an iota of truth to their portrayal in the Crown. But um, um, there was a sort of a dramatic event during the dance. Uh, Bob McNamara, Linda remembers this, Bob McNamara, uh, then Secretary of Defense, was twirling around the room, Christine Ford, wife of Henry Ford, it was a beautiful, actually gorgeous woman in a low cut white gown. And, um, and as he was twirling her around, uh, she had a, a wardrobe malfunction. And uh, <laughs> people, oh my God, oh, oh. But you know, she corrected it very quickly, but you can imagine that, that was the titter of the evening. Later at dinner, I was not seated at the table with the president, but she was, of course. And there was Kirk Douglas and um, Happy Rockefeller. But <laughs> the summary answer was none of that portrayed in the crown uh, was accurate. Well, now let me just add that. Uh, quite a few of the social aides claimed to have been the one dancing with um, uh, Mrs. Ford. And it's all I saved her. I pulled, it, you know, helped her pull it up and so forth. But I mean, it has been a story for over fifty years. Every time the social aides get together, we talk about what were you doing and what did you say, and you know, everybody. Well, to claim I, I was there. She she corrected herself. Uh, I'm sure Mike McNamara was trying to figure out how he could do that, and maybe so. Maybe that was their fantasy. But um, I used to talk of the town. Actually, there was a press secretary for Mrs. Johnson who was known for her humor um, named Liz Carpenter. And Christine Ford had a flower, probably a daisy, woven into her, I think you'd call, I would call it a big tail, but it probably has a more uh, sophisticated description than that for women's coiffure. So the next day, um, Liz Carpenter had a, flower, her pigtail that she was wearing in the office. Um, everybody knew exactly what, what she was doing, but it was a little humor attached to project. May I just say one more thing about it that was very interesting about uh, Daddy. He loved to dance. And of course, he always liked to dance uh, uh, with pretty ladies. And um, he, of course, would always be uh, seated next to the wife of whoever we were honoring that night. And um, he would would dutifully do uh, his dancing with his spouse, but he wanted to dance with everybody else. And he knew that the next day when people went home, they'd like to be able to say, last night I danced with the president. So he told the social aides, I want you to cut in on me. Now, nobody of this present generation knows what th that is, but you used to dance with somebody and then you would go over and tap uh, the shoulder and you would switch partners. So it was very unusual for some social aide to be interrupting the president, uh, but they dutifully did it. And uh, that way he was able to dance with many, many more women at the, at the dance. And that was always a great honor uh, for daddy and for the person who he chose to dance with. 
But it was very funny for the social aides to be interrupting the president <laughs> to switch partners. Well, it's great that he could enjoy those uh, those dinners. Lucy Bean Johnson, let me ask you about a more serious matter. You talked about all the really historic events and the historic people that you had a chance to meet or to see while you were living in the White House. Can you talk about something that you saw or someone you spoke to at the White House that you really feel like um, may, had an impact on you for the rest of your life? Well, we had in the White House what I call Daddy Duty. And Daddy Duty was sort of the command performance when my father was having some sort of official experience and I would go and look adoringly. <laughs> and uh, uh, the civil rights movement was all so very public and yet so very personal for me. On my 17th birthday, my father wrote me a little note telling me how much he loved me. He, he was busy that day. He didn't actually have time to go out and buy a birthday card. And so the only handwritten note I really have from my father was written for me on July the 2nd, 1964. And about five or six hours later, he was downstairs in the East Room signing the 1964 civil rights legislation into law. Uh, nobody will ever get a better birthday present from anybody than that birthday present for me that year. A year later, on August the 6th, 1965, I was on daddy duty and my sister and mother were away, I think in New York City. And I was supposed to be with my father when he was going to sign the 1965 Voting Rights Act into law. Well, in my adolescence, I assumed something none of us should ever do in public life, but I assumed that the uh, event would take place in the East Room of the White House. After all, the uh, signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act had taken place there. But my father asked me to meet him in the diplomatic reception room. And I said, yes, sir, of course, but it was quizzical to me. Didn't quite understand why I was going from upstairs in the residency to downstairs to the, into the diplomatic reception room to back upstairs to the East Room. But I said, yes, sir. And we got to the uh, diplomatic reception room and my father said, come on, let's go. And I said, well, where are we going, Daddy? And he said, we're going up to the Capitol. Well, uh, I realized I had places to go and things to do, and I had assumed that I was going to be on daddy duty for about an hour or so, and I realized we were going up to the Capitol. It was going to take a lot longer, and what was I going to do and say? There were no uh, cell phones in to call and cancel your dates. You just sort of just didn't show up then. And uh, my father said, as he often did when he was somewhat disappointed in me. He referred to me by my double name. And he said, Lucy Baines, we are going to the Capitol because there are going to be many brave men and women who will not be returning to the Capitol because of the courageous vote they took to support the voting rights bill. And there are going to be some extraordinary men and women who will be coming to the Capitol as a result of this legislation who could have never, otherwise never have come. Well, we got up to the Capitol and I stood behind my father and I found myself no longer thinking about my adolescent whims and where I was going and what I was going to be doing. But what an honor, by accident of birth, that I was standing behind the President of the United States as he signed this legislation into law, a piece of legislation that would do so much to make ours a more just country. I watched this all take place, and when we got back into the car, I uh, asked my father again a question that uh, sent him into a moment of disappointment. I said, Daddy, why on earth, when you signed that legislation with all the great civil rights leaders there, why did you give that pen used to sign the Voting Rights Act to that 
old, grumpy, disheveled Republican leader, Everett Dirksen. And my father shook his head and again in disappointment that his own daughter uh, didn't get the obvious lesson because daddy was forever a school teacher. And he said, Lucy Baines, I gave that pen to Everett Dirksen because if he hadn't been willing to support this legislation and bring his folks with him, those great civil rights leaders and I, we'd have had a bill, we'd have never had a law. Uh, in October of that year, I was with my father again on daddy duty. Uh, I think that uh, our wonderful chief of protocol, Lloyd Hand, has already made reference to the fact that the first pope uh, was coming to the United States for the, excuse me, the Pope was coming to the United States for the first time. And I was a Roman Catholic convert. And my father knew it means something to me to be there with him. And so he had invited me to come. But before we went to the Waldorf Astoria to meet uh, the Pope, we were going to be outside in front of the Statue of Liberty signing that first big comprehensive immigration bill into law. And there I was once again, witnessing life changing forever in my country. And I believe for the better. So here I've mentioned three phenomenal pieces of legislation that I was an eyewitness to or had a significant role in my personal life. It was all so very public, yet it was all so very personal. And I am forever grateful that I got to be a witness to history. And those memories will stay forever in my mind. And you know, one of those great men that came to the Capitol as a result of that voting rights bill, uh, he died last summer and along with him, a uh, part of all of America's heart. John Lewis was a giant of a man whom I was privileged to get to know personally on a variety of other occasions. And so, yes, those memories will be forever precious to me and I will be forever grateful to have shared them. Such, such remarkable moments of history. You know, uh, Linda Johnson, I mentioned a photo to you that's on the cover of a book that uh, John Dickerson wrote that came out last year. The book is called The Hardest Job in the World. And it has this photo of your, of your father looking with his head almost on a table, listening so intently to an old style tape recorder. When I mentioned this to you, you instantly knew what the photo was showing. Tell us what that photo was showing. Well, Chuck and I got married in December and he left in March to go to Vietnam. And um, I moved back in the White House. We had gotten married and we'd moved to a little, rented a little place for us to stay until he left. And since I was pregnant and didn't have any other place to go, I went back to my same room in the White House. And um, uh, I wrote Chuck every day. And I also began to send him tapes. These were cassette tapes. And he tried not to write me about some of the things that he witnessed. Um, he was a company commander of a rifle company, which he says is the best job uh, in the Marine Corps, except maybe being commandant. But um, it was a very important job for him and it changed his life. And he is um, uh, in April, coming up, he's going to be publishing a book about some of his adventures. And there'll be lots of stories, I think, in there about Vietnam. But um, so daddy thought it'd be a good idea if Chuck would send me some tapes. But mind you, he's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but he did send, us, send me several tapes and they were meant for me. They were meant for his wife, not the, uh, the president of the United States. But I made a mistake one time of listening to one of the tapes and it was very dramatic. 
about, um, I think it was about an Amtrak that he was uh, in and leading uh, his troops through, um, through the area and they would send somebody out to try to check the road to make sure it wasn't bombed, but you never knew. And so he, on this tape, told about how he was behind an Amtrak and it uh, went over, I guess, it, it went over something and caused the whole thing to go up in, in fire. And he was trying to get all of his troops off and he lost a lot of men. And of course it could have been his Amtrak. He was right behind it. They were a bunch of them. And um, I made the mistake to let daddy listen to it. And so he took it and he had it put on uh, what we called a reel to reel, a big, big um, machine that he could play it on. And that photograph uh, taken in the cabinet room shows him and his, his terrible, painful, painful um, worry about Vietnam, worried about all of those men and some women who were over there who were doing their best to bring us peace and trying to, to resolve this. And Lucy's told so many good, good stories about how she was present at different things. And one thing I was just thinking about, and this is a new thing that's come to me. I went with daddy to Glassboro and their daddy met with a premier Kosygin and they met and it was in private. And I went off with uh, Mrs. Kavishiani, his daughter. And uh, we, you know, toured the sand dunes or whatever in New Jersey there. And I never knew what they said to each other or what went on in this meeting. I just knew that it was an outreach that daddy was making to the Russians to try to see how we could make this a, a safer world. And um, just in the last five years, it has come out that at Glassboro, he got Kosygin to agree to having the Russians intervene with the North Vietnamese who they were supporting and to bring the North Vietnamese to the peace table. And this was in Paris. And of course, daddy had said he wasn't going to run because he wanted to devote all of his energies to trying to, to uh, uh, bring solution to the war. And at that table, they had the North Vietnamese and the Americans and the South Vietnamese. And I never knew that they, the North Vietnamese were there to the peace table because the Russians had made this agreement with daddy. Now, unfortunately, uh, somebody went to them and said that uh, don't make this deal leave the peace table because you'll get a better deal with Nixon. And so we almost, almost um, got the war coming to an end then, but it didn't work out. And that was forever one of the very, very sad things that, because daddy, he loved his great society and he wanted things like Head Start and aid elementary and secondary education and, and so many of those wonderful civil rights programs that Lucy was talking about. That was all part of this great society. And he had such hopes and he could see that the war was taking all the, the energy uh, and the support that, that uh, was in the country away from those programs and replacing it with the terrible, terrible war that my husband was over there um, trying to, to do his best, his job for this country. And daddy knew that all of those people who were over there, our military, were trying to do their best to bring peace. And uh, we had the chance. And uh, I never knew that Glassboro was a part of it 
uh, until just a few years ago when, when um, it was, uh, I guess, the national security people decided to release the information. But uh, it came out, and, and I learned something about uh, those times that I had no idea about. And that picture symbolized daddy's frustration and hurt and anger. And, and it was a very difficult time for all of us. And daddy was so relieved when Chuck came home and greeted his, his little daughter, who was at that time six months old, and he had never seen her. So um, it was... It was a time that was just so horrible. And it's the story of what might have been and how many people would have lives would have been saved if we could brought could have had peace then. So that's not yes. it's telling about happy things. And I'm just having to tell you what what I was witness to. Well, we know with with every presidency, and, and uh, certainly with uh, with your father's presidency, there's a mix of uh, of things in that in that history. It's so interesting to hear both of your perspectives. And this this photo, I, it's so it so captures, I think, the pressures and responsibilities of the, of the presidency. As John Dickerson said, the hardest job in the world. We have just a few minutes left, and I want to close by talking not about your father, but about your mother. Uh, because she made a really enormous contribution to the White House Historical Association. Jackie Kennedy founded it, planted the seed. Your mother made sure that those seeds took root uh, to preserve and protect and honor the history of the White House. And I wonder if you could just talk about why, what, what she thought. Uh, why did she want to do that? And maybe talk and start with Lloyd. Lloyd, do you have any insight into that from your work with uh, uh, at the White House at that time as a protocol chief. Of course, you were around for a lot of events. You have a sense of why Lady Bird Johnson had this commitment to preserving the history of this of this house. Well, I think it began uh, much earlier. She did much to beautify uh, around the ranch, uh, around the area where the president was born and grew up. Um, but um, it began when she was pushing hard to remove the ugly billboards that you're probably not old enough to remember that lined most of the highways around the country. And she was successful in that, in the Beautification Act. And then she said about beautifying Washington. I will tell you, Susan, that outside of my own family, she's one of the most wonderful women I've ever known. When I was a young, just out of law school, going to work for him when he was majority leader. And that was a tough call for me. Uh, man and I talked about it, decided we were going to Washington for one year's experience. Well, it didn't work out quite that way. But but she she was rather shy. And when there would be meetings at the at the ranch, she would start to be out on one side. She was studying Spanish. She was taking elocution courses. Um, she, and I don't mean to deprecate, the president at all, but many people considered her the real intellectual in the family. It was not a secret. LBJ didn't read a lot of, of um, novels or other books, uh, but she was a prodigious uh, reader and and um, uh, was a, uh, the, the anchor, I would say. Many times he would be at times very upset about things. And she would put her hand on top of his, the backseat of the limo, say, now, now, Lyndon, now, now, Lyndon. And he would gradually calm down. He was, he was a stabilizer. Uh, and, and of course, she had a beauty about her that came from within. So she was manifesting that. And, and the wildlife flowers in the gardens in and around Austin and Travis County. But, but, around Washington, D.C. The beauty that you see in terms of the flowers, those were, those were the ideas of Mrs. Johnson, Lady Bird. I never called her Lady Bird, but, but um, uh, those who were her dearest friends did and others, others who didn't know her very well. But 
I think that uh, it was a love of beauty and a wanting to make a difference. Uh, and, you know, she, she following Jacqueline Kennedy, I can say this, the daughters aren't going to say this, but, but she suffered because people were quick to contrast this young, uh, svelte, uh, very fashion model with an older woman who had a twang in her voice and, and she would be mocked. But over time, she became uh, one of the most outstanding first ladies ever. Uh, you read uh, many articles about first ladies. There was a recent um, uh, series uh, on CNN about first ladies. And if you happen to listen to that, you heard what I'm saying. Uh, so to answer your question, I think that it came from within her to try to make it ever. She did. Anybody who talks about the beautification, people at the Interior Department, uh, many other countries, she was very much involved in uh, the cherry blossom uh, uh, around the turning basin when uh, the Japanese had to replace uh, some that were lost. Mrs. Johnson were very, very much involved in that. She was a great supporter of the Blair House, the president's guest house. Uh, she was very much involved in trying to make a difference. And yet she was low key. She was not flamboyant. Uh, she wasn't trying to be anything except what she was. But she was a solid, smart, beautiful, lovely woman. Even I remember the last time I saw her and uh, was at Linda Chuck's house. They had a dinner party. By this time, she had lost her voice. And so when she talked to you, she had to write a little note down on a notepad. But she would just laugh about whatever the subject matter was. It, she was undaunted by whatever befell her. She had a, just a very special uh, element, quality about her that uh, was rare. And... Um, uh, my wife and I were were privileged to know her and to be a part of the Johnson family. And I guess that's why I spent 16 years with them, often on the payroll, mostly on the payroll. <laughs> well, Lucy, and then let me, let just, me give you a chance to say uh, perhaps a, a final word about your mom and how she felt about living in the White House. Lucy, do you want to go first? I'd love to. Uh, when my mother was editing her White House diary, she brought it to me and asked me to help the project. I was deeply flattered, but knew the limitations of my my skills and, and said, Mother, I, uh, I'm just going to support your efforts here. But over the years, as, I, as time progressed, I would go back and read and reread, looking through a different prism, a, a prism of a, an older individual. And I recognize over time, just in the first weeks of my mother uh, becoming first lady of the country, just how much the White House Historical Association meant to her and how deeply concerned she was that these fabulous people that had joined with Mrs. Kennedy to try to um, bring back a life and a history to the White House that had abdicated. Because you see, in the beginning, uh, our forefathers were very concerned about giving too much of a budget to the, to the presidency, uh, lest, uh, they become an imperial presidency. So uh, presidents would come and they bring their own uh, possessions, they bring their own furnishings, and then they take them away. And those furnishings would be handed down to descendants or sold. And and uh, the, what was left at the White House itself was not necessarily of the, uh, the quality or the history that uh, um, Mrs. Kennedy had hoped for. So she had brought together an extraordinary group of people who uh, had beautiful taste, an interest in history, an understanding of fine arts and decorative arts, and frankly, the economic capacity to either purchase themselves and give or find others who might be willing to. 
Well, November 22nd happened, and my mother was deeply concerned that uh, all of those people who had joined the White House Historical Association and its efforts might want to leave because their allegiance was primarily to Mrs. Kennedy. And mother was a prodigious reader, as, as Lloyd Hand has uh, just made reference. And I remember her uh, getting down to her papers and trying to master and understand uh, just exactly what the issues were for the White House Historical Association and how desperately concerned that she rise to the occasion and show these people who were involved that uh, she too was a student of history. She had an undergraduate degree in it. She had an appreciation for all the hard work they did. She wanted them to come and stay and help because they were invaluable to the history of this great house that is indeed the president's house, a house for all of us to love, a house that tells the story of the American presidency, but yes, the American people. And so when I've gone back and reread the White House diary in its first weeks and months, I've realized just how deeply important the White House Historical Association was to Mother and how proud I've been that uh, she rose to that occasion as she did so many out of love of country and a hope that she could do her part. You know, like Ms. I, I know Ms. Johnson graduated from the University of Texas. The president didn't, he was Southwest Texas. But the reason the LBJ Library and the LBJ School of Public Affairs are on the campus of the University of Texas is because of Mrs. Johnson. You know, um, so it's so wonderful to, to hear the stories. And of course, the whole nation is grateful to your, to uh, to Mrs. Johnson for what she did in, in preserving and starting that process that continues today at the White House. Yet, Linda Johnson, Rob, I wonder if we could close with a story that you you told me um, uh, when we were preparing for this, which is it goes to your mother's understanding of how thrilling it could be for Americans to be able to just see a bit of the White House. And it involves the story of her, I, I guess, as a young woman going to the gate uh, just as a tourist with a camera. Can you tell us that story, please? Well, Daddy gave Mother a moving uh, a movie camera, and Mother used it. And so we now have at the LBJ Library uh, movies, Mother standing outside the White House gates, taking pictures, taking movies of Mrs. Roosevelt and leaving the White House. She has pictures of Mrs. movies of Mrs. Roosevelt coming to the Senate ladies' luncheons. And uh, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful movies because she saw this as a tourist. She was a great tourist. She loved going and seeing historical homes. And, and that's why she wanted the most beautiful things that belong to America, the history of America in the White House. Mm. And she also invited White House descendants with the hope, I, I won't say this exactly, but I think mm. She wanted to, to uh, have them come with the desire that they might uh, give a piece of their family, their uh, descendants, uh, artifacts, things they used in the White House. And I know we got a beautiful, beautiful piece uh, from the Adams family. I think the Adams family are probably the best because they were so many of them, uh, all the different Adams. And uh, so they had lots that they could do, but she also uh, wanted to share the White House with everybody. And so while daddy would be downstairs meeting with members of Congress and having receptions, and they would be learning about different pieces of the great society or what was going on in the war or whatever daddy wanted to personally talk to them about, the spouses were invited to come upstairs and they were people whose, whose husbands had been in Congress for 20, 30 years, and they had never been upstairs in the private quarters. And that was one thing that she did that I think everybody loved because it was exciting. And she divided them into, say, four or five different receptions. 
And she also sometimes had the entertainment upstairs. So one of the things that she would do is she would invite um, some young people uh, that had connections with Congress to come and speak. And she had Jay Rockefeller come and talk about what he was doing uh, in West Virginia uh, with the one of the one of the great society programs that he was involved in. She had quite a few presidential descendants who came and spoke at these receptions. And it was just great fun. And I love to hear all the stories about what other uh, first families had done. But it was a great opportunity to share uh, the presidency and the rooms with, with other people. And, you know, Alice Longworth had had lived there when she was a young woman and had gotten married. And so when Chuck and I got married, we got, you know, her manual and said, okay, what did you do about this and that and the other? And I think people liked it better when Lucy got married because although we told everybody we did not want any state gifts, we uh, uh, did receive a silver cup uh, from Great Britain. And, um, there were several things like that. And that, of course, we were following Alice and she was telling us about these rugs and all of these Oriental presents we had received. And, and uh, she still had some of them in her house. So it was great uh, meeting the people who were there before I was there. And uh, so that was exciting. And mother loved sharing all of those memories, all those exciting things with everybody else. The Congress first and foremost, because she she knew that if you do something for someone's wife or their <laughs> children, they appreciate it sometimes much more than if you do it for them. And so uh, she wanted to share all the good things that she was enjoying in the White House with, with everybody. And it was a well, wonderful, wonderful time. Well, we're all we're all grateful for that. It's it truly is America's house. You know, a lot of people know the White House Historical Association through the the Christmas ornaments it offers each year, which began years ago with first an ornament honoring George Washington, our first president. I'm glad to report that this year, the White House Historical Association has worked its way up finally to to Lyndon Johnson, our 36th president. That ornament is going to be unveiled soon, and we're all looking forward to seeing it. Let me just thank uh, all of you for, for joining us uh, today and t sharing some of these wonderful, historic, remarkable, and in some cases, pretty funny stories about life in the White House. Linda Johnson, Rob, Lucy Baines Johnson, Lloyd Hand, thank you all so much. Thank you. And with that- Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. It was thank our you. joy to, to be able to share these moments of history and of uh, family times with you and uh, we hope that they turn out to be helpful to the White House Historical Association because I can tell you it meant the world mother and we hope to be a credit to it and to uh, my parents administration. Well thank you all and let me now turn it back to Stuart. Stuart it's all yours. Thank you Susan, Linda, Lucy and Lloyd for your wonderful insights on President Johnson as father, friend, and leader of our country. We're honored to have had the opportunity to work with you on this program. Thank you all for joining today's program. I hope you'll continue to remain engaged with the numerous initiatives and programs that we will be undertaking during this 60th anniversary year. And remember, the White House Historical Association is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that relies on the support of people like you. If you are interested in supporting the White House Historical Association, I encourage you to visit our website at whitehousehistory.org backslash support. I now want to welcome one of our National Council on White House History members, Terry Cole. She will close our program. Terry and her husband, Marty, both attended the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. Thank you, Terry, for your support and encouragement of all we do. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Stuart, for the introduction. It's my honor to be a part of this program, reflecting on the many accomplishments of President Johnson. I'm joining you today from my home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. 
In addition to being a current member of the White House Historical Association's National Council, many years ago, my husband and I were students at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. The LBJ School gave us the opportunity to interact with interesting people from President Johnson's administration. There was even the opportunity to visit the Johnson Ranch and have tea with the kind and gracious Mrs. Johnson. I enjoyed hearing today from those who knew President Johnson best, Linda Johnson Robb, Lucy Baines Johnson, and Lloyd Hand. During my time in Austin, I gained an appreciation for the significant impact that President Johnson had in helping people reach for the American dream. With his leadership in civil rights, voting rights, and the great society programs like Head Start. I would like to thank the White House Historical Association for hosting this program. The association does a masterful job preserving and celebrating the history of the People's House, the White House. <laughs>